and Skurf Live. We had some janky internet just a little while ago. I was trying to play the intro, but we're going to come on in with some music and I'll switch up the banner and we're going to get into it tonight. Yes, we are. Once again, welcome back to another episode of Landscurve Live. I'm glad to be here. I'm not going to lie. I am dog tired. It caught up with me, but I have my best performances when I'm a little fatigued, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm a strange character. I'm sucking on a, a, a tonic, very strong uh, a B12, iron, stuff like that. When I have these every now and then, I feel like a million bucks kind of fills in the gaps. I live above a pharmacy in this particular apartment. You know, we're building a home, but for now we live in the apartment, but it's so convenient to have the pharmacy below me. And the young lady who was supposed to close up at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, it worked out for me because I said, oh, I'm not going to catch her because I'm up here preparing the show. And I made it for 10, 15 to give myself an extra bit of time to go downstairs and walk down the block and pick up a few things. So it didn't work out, but I did get the tonic and she was so caught up in watching some particular type of show that she has there that she stayed a little extra, so it worked out for me. But yeah, over here, you know, I always run my mouth a little bit before I get into the show. But Willie C. Holman Jr., welcome. Patrick Gilbert, always welcome. Thank you for being here. Everybody told me they like this style of show, so I will continue to do it, as well as the other uploads that we get roundabout. I got a crap load of, I can't say irrelevant, uh, uh, footage, but stuff in the street here and there, nothing specific. We will be getting some interviews this weekend out in the street as I go around and about. I know Mr. Skurve is going to the market, so you know me with my tricky camera. I'm going to get it. <laughs> we'll just stop people in the street. Hey, I ask them questions, right? That adds, that makes my day fun and it connects it to what I do here as opposed to just sitting, you know, in a room with the mic, you know, with the banner and just talking. It's better this way, you know, just, just to do the roundabout thing so you can see us in action. Not that we're special or anything like that. It's just, you know, I want you to see that we're real people. I want you to see that there's lots of times we're out in the street, you know, toiling around like anybody else, going to the markets, walking up and down, sometimes just sightseeing because, you know, for now, in the way I choose to look at it, this is this is home. This is the motherland. Yes, it has its issues. Yes, some of the people are cool, cool. Some of them are cool. But you're going to find that anywhere. And for me to enjoy life as a perpetual tourist, I'm not a tourist, but a tourist who feels at home. You see what I mean? With a lot of new stuff in front of me, a lot of a lot of new horizons to look over, not the same old streets. So it's like, OK, I've been here for the last 30, 40, 50 years. I know what to expect. I need a vacation. So here is the opposite. And when I have the need to come back to New York City, you know, Orlando, Florida, different places I live, more so New York City, because that's my route, then it won't be a vacation. It'll be a recalibration. And it's a weird feeling to be able to be over there and say, you know what, let me go back home. It, it is a weird feeling because home is always in the United States. But we know that part of the story with me and Mrs. Skurve. So 
I've been doing a lot of things different, different banners, different styles of talking, different things. And I want to keep things refreshed. I'm a creative person and I'm going to keep continuing to be inspired that way to keep things fresh. That's the way I love to do it. And with this show, as always, on the landscape of live, there's always some freestyle going on. So, yeah, I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth. Now, last night we were up for like three hours and 30 something minutes or whatever. This won't be that long. We have Beatrice Noel tomorrow. I will be putting up some things tomorrow, and I will do a live probably before we have the show with her. And um, you know, when she comes on, she comes on for a sizable time. So there'll be a lot of stuff to deal with um, and to cover. And on her show, I'm always cracking jokes in the background anyway. Sunday, we'll do something. Me and Mr. Scurve, whatever. Look, we got stuff coming. You, you know our style. We don't have to really, you know, convince you of what we do. And every now and then, we take a day off and just chill. So I am extremely fatigued tonight, but I'm going to put in I'm going to put in a little time, at least an hour, hour and 15 minutes, which seems like it's short compared to what we usually do. And who knows? I'm tired, but who knows if I don't go longer and beat last night's record? <laughs> we, we, we were going to wait and see. But I wanted to speak about black leaders. When they say black leaders on the so-called mainstream Caucasian news platforms they always say you know so and so black leader uh al sharpton black leader al sharpton african-american leader jesse jackson minister lewis farrakhan black leader maybe they should say influencer but leader i don't know yes riri thanks thank god it's friday we're here exactly in the good place let me take a little shot of this uh to uh tonic that i have here give me one second folks Mm, has a sweet taste to it, but not a sugary taste. It's a medicine type taste. And it's one of those little vials that's glass that you have to pop off the skinny end. Makes it seem more like it's powerful that way. <laughs> but I'm um, very concentrated. And I got to keep, make sure that soon I'm going to have to go and get a checkup, just a routine checkup, just to keep old Scurve in running order and detect anything that may need to be corrected. We as black men and black women have to do this in this stress, the stress infested society. Many of us, I'm not going to say all of us, but I, do, I, I know many of you will agree that when I say stress infested, stress embedded, not that just, you know, submitting to that word stress, because the word stress is stressful enough. <laughs> you know, it's like you're just accepting it, you know. I don't know. But um, like I said, we got to take care of ourselves because we're so used to walking with, with this oppressed or suppressed feeling that it has become normalcy for us. And we got to stop that. We just think it's normalcy for us. And that's why we end up transitioning earlier than our uh, pink counterparts. And they're the ones with the weak genes. But we're the ones leaving out before them. them. Isn't that something? So it shouldn't go that way. It shouldn't go that way. As strong as we are. And we can't take our strength for granted. Strength has to be nurtured. Strength has to be taken care of. Look, you have a big muscle car, the kind of having the races back in the day. Even today, you know, uh, NASCAR races. You know, look, those are some very, very strong and very efficient vehicles for racing. They're made for racing. And um, yeah, that's a good word, recessive. I'm going to start using that word. <laughs> Auto Royale, welcome, welcome. <laughs> oh, if I'm buffering, please let me know. Um, I think my internet is okay from this end, it seems to be. But I um, shouldn't be doing that right now. But who knows? It's, it's, it's their stuff. It's their gadgetry. But with those vehicles, you see them on the track for the short period of time that they're on the track. And you got to realize how much care goes into those vehicles. How many different people who are specialists who do things to that vehicle and, and make sure the tires are right, make sure the transmission, oh, no, no, there's no transmission in that, right? But make sure the engine is right and make sure the cooling system is right and the suspension. Yeah, things we do to our own vehicles. But more so, everything has to be calibrated perfectly or to the utmost of what it can be. Do we do that with our bodies? We usually go until we feel something wrong with us. 
an ache or pain. And even then, if there's a persistent ache or pain, we push through it. And that could be our body warning us. You know, we don't have a dashboard like a vehicle does to say, hey, the oil is low. Oh, the transmission fluid is low. Oh, there's too many revolutions. You got you got a you got a red line and overheat. No, we don't have that. We have to look at the signs that our body gives us. But we have to be aware of it. Like I told you, when you're eating too much toxic stuff, and the, the next morning, you got so much goop in the corner of your eye, and that's your body telling you, cool out with the stuff. You don't need to be eating that. And like I said before, me on, on a spiritual level, if I'm eating really, really clean, the way I know to eat clean, where I'm not waking up with all that stuff in the corner of my eye, and I get a, around toxic people, they can be smiling, they can be acting nice. If I'm around them for a sizable amount of time, and I wake up the next morning, I still got that stuff in my eye. That's my body telling me that there's stuff and substances and entities around you that you don't need to have around you. See, we are so not aware of the spiritual levels. We, we, we have been fooled, even those of us, many of us who understand it, we have to keep pushing to understand it because we can get pulled into the whole religious mentality with it. Religion is not spirituality. We think religion is supposed to point us to that, but I mean, if the car is wrecked, I don't mean wrecked, banged up, but the mechanism not working right, and you pull over to give that vehicle a jump start, if the system's in there not working correctly and the battery's dead, the engine seized up, the tires are flat, no fluid in the system, and you could jump start that thing all you want, it's not going to work, meaning that you can go to your house of worship, as much as you want, you can talk to talk, you can walk the walk, you can feign being in some kind of spirit for a time. What's the use of being in the spirit for a short period of time in this uh, uh, aerobic, cardiovascular, calisthenic type of display? No, you peeking out the corner of your eye, you, know, you want to show off, and then the rest of the week you're raising hell. The rest of the week you're evil. The rest of the week you, you're not doing as you should. Why not be uh, a spiritual on a steady level? And again, spiritual just doesn't mean always good because the demons out there and the entities out there, they operate on a spiritual level also. You know, that's like saying, oh, let's get some food and you don't know what you're going to eat. You might be vegan, vegetarian. You might be somebody who restricts certain things. You just, oh, I just want to go get some food. And then you go get some greasy, oily junk food. The people around you do it and say, hey, here's some food. You can't turn around and say, I can't eat this. You just said food. You didn't say, you know, I don't want it fried. I don't want any gluten in it. I don't want any dairy in it. I don't want any soy in it. I don't want any extra sugar in it. You just said food. So when you say spiritual, somebody says, yes, I'm very spiritual. You can be talking to the most hateful fool in the entire planet. But I thought you said you were spiritual. Yeah, I am. And I can't stand your ass. They'll tell you. You know what I mean? They'll try to sabotage you. They'll try to sink your ship. They'll try to rock your boat. They'll try to capsize your, 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 your sailboat. But they're spiritual. We're all spiritual, good and bad. But what do you lean toward in your sense of spirituality? Because some people say, oh, there was some little pissy ass girl that said that. I can't remember what a big head name was. Oh, but, but they're not spiritual. Everything's spiritual depends on what side of the road you're on you see and um yeah let me see something here let me see something here i'm looking at these uh comments and stuff sister oyala welcome home my beautiful sister queen midas uh ryan koal am i saying it right I'm, I'm, if i jacked it up please much love to you didn't mean to do that you know I'm a little lazy in the tongue tonight. I'm a little drowsy tonight, so I may sound like I'm slurring my words, but I don't consume those types of things. And um, Riri said, and I'm going to read most of the comments anyway, Jamie is hiding in the hospital, claiming he's afraid for his life and believes he was poisoned drug to avoid his testimony in the Pras Obama Rico trial. He was called uh, as a witness. You know what? I, Riri, did not know that. I did not know that. This is why I said, why the mystery? I was going to try to break it down, but you broke it down right there. I got to put this up and let this hang for a little bit. He's hiding in the hospital. Hmm. So they're trying to, they trying to knock him off. That's why there's so much going to it. And I didn't want to jump to that, but 
Why not? Let's do it. You know, I thought it was a Hollywood thing. But in Hollywood, with him doing all of these movies, with him putting in all this work, with him seemingly doing everything politically correct to walk with these devils, I was saying to myself, why would they go after him? I'm not calling him a coon. No, I'm not calling him that. Maybe some people would, but he's playing the game, right? So he knows the world that he's in. So I wouldn't really call him a coon because he knows what he's doing in that Hollywood circle, but he knows the game. He knows the game. Like, like, like I'm doing the internet game. There's certain things that YouTube is looking for me to say, and I ain't going to say it in the way that they want me to say it so they can come at me. So am I going to go out a hero and say, yes, I'm going to stand up to them? And they knocked the platform down. And so I lost connection with so many thousands of people. I'm not playing the game like a coon where, you know, you, you got to appease master. No, I don't. I'm not about that. I will say that. And they cannot get me for saying that. But I'm playing the game smarter now and still getting the message out. And that's why you all can go to Patreon and you can hear some of the raw good conversations. I have to thank um, Master Glam. Uh, mix uh, genre faves, Landon Price, uh, Tracy J for putting in some good long conversations, but I wanted that to be something that's always there, but I, I still got to put my own stuff and I have not been doing it. But if you go to landscurve.com, you'll see how beautiful the website has turned out. Um, and the best experience for that is to go on a computer. It works on a cell phone, but it's kind of like altered. You don't get the big bang as when you go on a laptop or on the computer, but, um, yeah, look at it. what you say, Queen Mess. I don't see why he breeds white women. Yeah, I noticed that about him too. And that's a thing that I guess is um, something that is favorable in those circles to bring because they know they're going to get that money if he marries one. He's going to get, they're going to get that money back into the white community, you know. And here, Riri said again, Proud's re- pretty much snitched on the self and everybody else, the nerve. And to represent himself, I've got to reset, research that more. Okay, um, admittedly, I don't know all about that part, but I know there's something in my spirit that was telling me there's something more to me to eye with that, which is obvious because he's he's a man who has always kept himself in shape. Now, shape doesn't mean anything really and truly if there's something faulty with the mechanism. You know, I mean, you can look at a vehicle and everything, and, and it could seemingly be right, but there's one small thing that stops it from working. And it's a delicate thing, the human body. And as we move over 50, which I'm not sure, what is he, 53 or something like that? Well, no matter how good you take care of yourself, you you have to take care of yourself more. And still things out of nowhere can happen. Genetics, what 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 runs through your family? What do you have a propensity for? You know, um, you got to walk a little, you got to walk the, you know, the tightrope a little more cautious. Even me, I'm learning to pamper myself a little more. It's 60 years old. I'm like, God, dog. And so when I feel fatigue like this and it's catching up with me, I, I'm I'm not going to stop doing anything that I do, but I'll back off and take an active rest. Like when I was training as a bodybuilder when I was a teenager, you know, you have a competition, you train so hard for it and you're beat up, but you don't want to just, oh, just, we just sit home for two or three weeks. No, go lighter, go to the gym, keep the habit up, keep the routine up, but, but do a, a small percentage of what you were doing and do not push yourself. And see, one thing we have to understand, whether it's Jamie Foxx or not, we see the finished product. Oh, it's a movie. And then we'll look on TMZ or look on some other show that deals in Hollywood or some website. And they say, yes, here we are at the the set of the the movie that's going to be coming out in two years. Got to remember these guys, for the most part, the top guys, the favorite people. I mean, men and women, when I say that. They're, they're in that lane where once you get on a roll, once you get a good reputation, once you have that work ethic, whatever else other might be going on in Hollywood, I'm not going to make it seem like it's something so wholesome. But the bottom line is that, you know, you're on a roll and you're working on things that folks won't see a year or two or three or four from now. And so, like I said, with the, with the cameramen on these different uh, television shows that I've worked on, those who were or had clearance uh, to work amongst the politicians and, you know, they knew they weren't any terrorists. They were only with so many of these cameramen around to uh, uh, to do the camera work on set and these interviews and to get close to the people. 
and they were on burnout. I mean, they were like, like I said, they said if, if, if we had four to five hours of sleep in one night, that was a luxury. And, you know, they say you need eight. Sometimes you get a little older, maybe you need six and a half, seven. All I say is sleep until you wake up. And when you wake up, you got to wake up peaceably and then lay there for a little while until your body says, listen, get up and get out. Now, if you're dealing with a hangover, your body's not going to tell you that. You're going to lay there longer. But your body talks to you and just listen to it. So you got to remember these guys, no matter how much uh, stuff is catered for them on these sets, they may be in an exotic location. They have to allot a certain amount of money and effort to say, listen, we're going to get this amount of this. We're going to have this. We're going to eat this. We're going to eat that. They have to keep their nourishment up. That's a lot of money, but it's still a stress on the body. When your sleeping patterns are thrown off, when you're eating different stuff, and not only that, but when you're eating in different climates, different altitudes, different places, this will have an effect on your bowel movements. You can walk around constipated if you're in a dry place, and you don't you don't anticipate that. But there are a lot of factors living in different places where you have to anticipate, you know, different things you have to anticipate. Like me moving over here, I'm going to tell you, that's not too much, too much information, but usually in America, okay, when I lived in Florida and even when I lived in New York City, it's a little different with the climate. It affects your bowel movements and it affects how you urinate and how frequently you urinate. Well, I would drink something. I love to drink water, juices, different things. And it wasn't long before, you know, my bladder started talking to me and saying, hey, find a tree or a toilet and take care of business. Well, out here, when I first moved out here, now I'm kind of better with that because um, in September of this year, it would be three years that I lived out, lived out here in West Africa in Ghana. So but I, I noticed that after like maybe three or four days, because I keep up with my body and everything that happens with it, it's like, wait a second, I haven't been peeing as much. What the hell is going on? Because I was not sweating profusely one time, like I ran around the block a couple of times, but it was a constant letting off of bodily fluids through my sweat. My skin was always moist yeah, in the, in the sun. And I sweat easy too, but it was always water being let off through my skin. And I didn't have to go as much through my genitalia, <laughs> right? So I figured that out. I was like, oh, that's the reason why. Now, I still go to the bathroom and I still drink a lot, but it wasn't like that strong sense of urgency because a lot of it, a good percentage of the fluids that have to get out of you came out through the skin. So I, that observation I found to be very, very interesting. And there's still uh, changes that I have to deal with here. I'm going to be here years and still have to deal with certain changes. That's just the way it's going to be. Because look, I'm 60 years old. I live 57 and a half years in the United States, things are like just going to change all of a sudden, like, okay, you know, you're here now, boom, it's done. So could you imagine when these people are shooting movies all over the world, like say, okay, they may have a set that looks like a certain place, but it may not be that. Well, that's one thing. But now if you have to go out into uh, the Sahara Desert for real, and they're going to shoot some scenes, it may not be deep into it, it might be on the edge, but it's a different place than you were maybe two years or two days ago in Hollywood or in Philadelphia or in Miami, boom, you're here. It's weird. It's a weird feeling. It really is a weird feeling. So after the three weeks that I first came and I was first visited out here, my body began to acclimate a little bit. And then here we are coming back, boom, and flew right to New York and right back to Florida. And I, of course I had malaria then, but it was just a weird feeling overall. It was a really, really weird feeling. So those things take a wear and tear in your body when you are not only an actor or an actress, but if you're a camera, one of the camera people, producers, all of that is easy to get sick. And the question I have with this whole thing, like movies never stop being made all through that period of 2020 and the, and the things that were going on around that time while we had to wear a mask. And I don't think that's too criminal to say, but from what I'm hearing, most in Hollywood had to take that, if you know what take that means, right? So that in itself, that was a big concern when people sort of find concern for Jamie Foxx and say, uh-oh, this guy's in great shape. You know, I know he takes care of his health. He looks at, you know, he glows. 
That's why he can have such a high work output. But is it that 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 is messing with him now? Because there are a lot of athletes, a lot of people in shape, a lot of people who just didn't have any prior problems. We know that people can have problems and not know it. But we know that that thing, that thing, that thing, that thing. <laughs> I don't want that thing, that thing, that thing. No. Oh, no. And I know individuals who proudly tell me, yes, I took it and I'm protected from this. And okay, okay. I'm not here to argue. And they say, Lance, I know your stance on that. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm not preaching to nobody. You know, I might go out there and tell them, yeah, I'm good because I didn't take it and get hit by a car. Slip in the tub and break your neck. You never know. It's just like that. That's life. But yeah, Jamie Foxx, whatever it may be, and what Riri said seems to be the truth. Um, I'm going to really, let me see, look into this a lot more, you know. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, it, it, it is a movie, Lance. Leonard DiCaprio, who also had to testify, also got money from that Chinese to make that film Wolf of Wall Street. Ain't they about that? Wow. Wow. And they covered little of the news. See, I, see, I don't know everything. I don't know everything. And I'm hip to this now. I, I want to talk about that. Probably um, once I figure out to do a live on Patreon, I'll do that. We'll talk about it there live, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Raw, raw reality. Yeah. Yeah. They say he did it. Come on, man. As smart as you are, Jamie Foxx, I know they say you have to take certain things to travel with that, but at that point, I'm like, uh-uh. Uh-uh. We ain't making no movies unless it's right here completely. And if you say I have to take it, well, just forget about me. Uh, no, seriously. If, if I was in his position, I can't tell him what to do, but I'd have to cut it. And be like, listen, I'm not doing no more movies because that's my choice. And all the millions I made, I'm going to have to live off of that. And I think anybody sensible would be able to do so. But we don't know how the lifestyles, what people spend. Some of these people, money's no object. And they treat it that way. Now, come on now. Even some of us in our financial immaturity, we might carry ourselves that way. I'm not saying you to go out and buy a yacht off a regular civil service job money is <laughs> it's not going to happen. But you know, when you get that tax return or uh, whatever, a little extra something that you didn't anticipate you come into some money, it does change the way the world looks to you. You know, you go into the supermarket, you know, you get a little bottle of ketchup. You might get three different brands of ketchup. I want to taste that one and see what it looks like. You know, three different types of mustard. You know, you're buying lunch meat that you never even thought about eating. Like you never usually eat this stuff, but you're spending on it. And your shopping cart after coming into that money lots of times. And of course, you're going to have a little a little shout out, a little, a little celebration. You know, okay, I got a little more. I'm going to spend a little more. So you're not watching for a little while. And then when you go to your bank account, you look, you say, oh, God, dog. I spend a little, I'm still good, but I spend a little more than I should. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's that's um what it is. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, keep in mind the contracts. Those contracts, you, you know, you shouldn't be, you're probably not gonna be able to get out of it so fast. D Griffin, welcome. Jamie Foxx should hook up with Idris Elba into the movies in Africa. But you know, <sighs> you're right, D Griffin, but how 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 do these contracts work where we know they own your backside to a point, but making the movies in Africa, right? That's a good move and you will make money. You'll probably not make as much, but, and you're not going to get like pennies, but it's not like Hollywood. I wouldn't even care about that. I would, I would love to, if I was in Jamie Foxx's shoes, do something like that and bring my talent and bring a little bit of that money over there to set up some kind of studio or work along with a studio and really produce some things and be a crossover star in the motherland. That would be dope. That would be dope. That would be a slap in the face to Hollywood. And black folks are not going to stop looking at Jamie Foxx and others who would do that if he encouraged others to do that full time or even part time. That would be dope. And that would bridge the gap. And like with a lot of these Nigerian movies, and they have the Ghanaian movies, different countries and the different movies. Um, but I'm hooked on Nigerian movies. If you go on YouTube and look at some of these movies, just put in Nigerian movies, right? And watch any one of them, the modern ones. I don't know about the older ones. You'll be hooked. You, some of the writing 
and and the plots. Phew, trust me on that. I'm telling you, look at anyone. Now it's usually based around. There's a lot of cheating going on in the movies over there, you know, and it, it's it's crazy, you know, guys that act like they're bums and they get around some women to see who really loves them. And she did not know I was a billionaire type thing. You know, other people brushed them off and, you know, just different things like that. Or or wives falling in love with the houseboy, you know what I mean? And, and having to make the choice to be poor, you know, like him or stay in riches with a husband who she doesn't love anymore. And, and they get, they, they, they get grimy up in these bad boys, but not grimy, like sexual, nasty, degenerate type stuff, but they insinuate a lot, you know, and it's just fascinating. I love Nigerian movies, y'all. I'm going to start dropping some in the community and, and we share some around. And when you see them, you know, and, and there's other African countries that make movies, but I'm just saying that, it's more of a sure shot thing. I have never been disappointed with Nigerian movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Monk Million, welcome. Yeah, Nollywood. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, y'all, y'all know what time it is, right? Y'all know Oyala. Yeah, okay. So you know I'm telling the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And Raw Reality Sid here. Let's click it up here and see. I am sure Jamie Foxx has other investments that he can live off outside of Hollywood. Remember, he has a few arms out there. And he's he's getting royalties on exactly, exactly, and he has so much work that work from years ago, still coming in, you know, back to back to back to back. It's not like well he was a star in this movie thirteen years ago. <laughs> he's destitute now. He has got stuff going back as far music, the movies, probably other business investments that have nothing to do with the entertainment industry. You know, I'm not in anybody's pockets, but. We've got to assume this man is not dumb. He's a very smart man. And his family looks very happy. You know, they look like they love him. He loves them. And, um, yeah, maybe he is hiding out. That's something. You know, and so when I said why the mystery, it wasn't so much speaking about the family or him, the mystery surrounding it. Like, but Riri broke it out right there. But I still want to investigate more. And if he's doing that for real, that's a smart move. That's a smart move. Let me take a sip of this tonic again. Give me a second, y'all. Wow. This thing is powerful. <laughs> Tracy J in the house. <laughs> uh, you know, you had me crazy on that last uh, conference call that we did. And I want to thank Master Glam and, and uh, Mix Genre Faves and Landon Price. I think he came up for a little while. And I don't know if Sister Oyala was on there last night. I didn't listen to the whole thing, but I did it, did it bits and pieces and I put it up. It was like five hours and 53 minutes altogether. But it's a very interesting conversation. And um, I might take a snippet of it and tease the general public, you know, just to see the depths and the intelligence and the wisdom that everybody shares. You know, we have fun too. Now, the one the night before, I think it was, or two nights before, Tracy J was on there, Mick Jean Rafe was on there. I was going off. I was, I was, I was going off. <laughs> We're talking about relationships, stuff in the hoods, how how grimy men think, you know, little tactics they use, and low vibrational stuff, but it was very eye-opening. So I channeled a lot of the entities from the hoods that I know to show you how slick they can be. It's a crazy thing. But anyway, Jamie Foxx. Whatever it is, I hope that it's over soon, whether you are hiding out, whether it is some kind of ailment. And that, that, that's a really slick thing. Go to the hospital. Hide. Now, we know doctors and nurses, if, if it's not something actually physical and he's hiding out there, you still better be careful with them doctors and nurses because they'll get paid off by somebody to slip you something. You know, so you got to have to have family around you 24 hours anyway. Like that goes anyway. If you have a family member in the hospital, I do not trust these hospitals because you're a piece of meat for them. You're like body parts for them. They can do something to you and just claim something happened or whatever and put, sweep it under the rug. You need to have, just like the fruit of Islam, standing around, Minister Farrakhan, take shifts. Eight hours here, eight hours there. It, it, it may be tough. Maybe if you're working, you can do four hours during the work week. Maybe you don't do 
much during the work week, but you do more on the weekend or whenever your weekend is. And those who can do more, do more. Go there and sit down and sleep with them. They might be watching TV. You might doze off, whatever. They'll wake you up when somebody comes in. But let that hospital staff know that someone will always be here questioning everything because they're sneaky. They'll sneak you, sneak you some kind of funny pills. You know, if he's healthy and they're hiding out, well, they're not going to give any shots or anything. But you never know in the midnight hour. They give you a pill to knock you out, give you a little water. You sip in the water, there's something in it. You're knocked out. They come and shoot you up with something. Who knows, you know? But that's just the way it is. Ms. D. Nice, hello. Welcome on in. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, Oyala. You're an experiment for these hospitals, right? There's more racism in the hospitals. Exactly. And they have access to your records, your body. And they can do, imagine going to a straight up racist doctor, right? A straight up racist doctor that, <laughs> you know what I mean? Trying to off you, trying to knock you off. Imagine that. And can do so, can make up a, condition that you didn't think was there and you go believe in them oh well, you've had this for the last 10 years but you never noticed and when this happens so long and never about they write it down they can lie and what you gonna do they take you out they can't bring you back so don't put yourself in a position to get taken out i want to speak on these black leaders and i'm not going to sit here and go down their resume and what they did and what they didn't do we pretty much know those three faces, and it's not just about them. I'm going to speak in general, but I wanted to pick on the three usual suspects when we speak on, you know, black leaders. Now, why did I put Minister Farrakhan up there? Because, you know, there's a couple of things, associations with the Church of Scientology recently. Well, it's been a while now, a couple of years, not a decade or 15 years, whatever. And he's spoken highly of them, and I never understood why. And for me, I'm going to get it out the way quick, that I was like a card carrier member of the Nation of Islam. I just didn't make that move. People were like, it's just a matter of time before he does it. But it wasn't really for the religious aspect because I never really was into religion. I didn't want to adopt another religion. And it's the same ingredients in there. That's like saying two plus two is four, but three plus one is four. You know, two times two is four, five minus one is four. It leaves you in the same place. Religion is religion is religion is religion. Depends on what road you want to take it to. But like that car that can't get jump started because it's so messed up. Religion can't do anything to you or for you if you are spiritually dead. You got to detox off of this world. I'm not saying detox and leave the world or leave the planet. But for me, like I said at the time coming up, you know, growing up in New York City from very young, I remember seeing the Nation of Islam walking the streets, some of the newspapers, the original one, Muhammad Speaks. I remember all of that. The visuals are strong in my head and the imagery. And I know the Nation of Islam, you know, broke up after Elijah Muhammad passed away. What was that, like 75 or something like that? Farrakhan fell off the map. And I didn't know all of the politics back then. And many people didn't know unless they were in it. What was going on behind the scenes now that things are more public we have more youtube out there and people talking because it's the past now we kind of know what went down and it's still it's it's shrouded in a mystery cloak that we just don't get everything it's like trying to read um the eye chart with your peripherals <laughs> you can see the eye chart but you're not going to see the letters as opposed to looking at it dead on face on so there's a lot of mystery still with that and there's a lot of lot of questions. But at the time that I latched on to him, you know, I remember hearing him from when I was younger, right? I saw him one time in a barber shop. My father was there with me, and we weren't getting our hair done, but he was there talking. And I recall my father telling me, Yeah, yeah, you know, and it kind of hit me like, Yeah, but I can vaguely remember that. But I remember the way he was sitting in a chair, a regular chair, like he's waiting to get his hair done, but he wasn't. And all the barbers were standing around. This was a big barbershop. There's a lot of people in there just standing around listening to him. Like, like they forgot about cutting hair. Like, they were just listening to him, right? And I don't think he stayed long. But I remember him sitting. His shoes were shiny and his feet were together. He, he sat, but he was upright. And the way he spoke, I was like, wow. I didn't really grasp all the things he was saying because he was speaking about something that was going on with the civil rights movement, you know, prior. 
in the prior years. So I couldn't grasp that. I just saw how he presented himself. And um, he was, he was, you know, groomed down to the T, which if I was in his position, you wouldn't see me in shorts and T-shirts. I'd be groomed also in different ways, you know, and not just in a European way also. It would be a mixture. But um, that being said, as I got older and began to taste what America was all about even more so in New York City to hear these tapes, these cassette tapes being blasted from the various bookstores that carried his content, which there was one on Fulton Street. It was close to the Kingston Troop A-Train subway station. I'll never forget it. It was a Nation of Islam shop. It was a small shop, but you had black people walking up and down shopping and you had Farrakhan being blasted out, but it didn't, good high powered speaker, so it didn't sound like it was straining, but you'd hear his voice from down the block. And I remember being there I used to go to Brooklyn a lot, a couple of girlfriends out there, but, and just friends, I'd hear that. It would always catch me. And I was like, oh, that's Farrakhan. So I found myself going to that bookstore and getting cassette tapes, getting videotapes. There were places in Manhattan, of course, that had it, right? There was a place in Queens that I'll never forget. And I, I wonder if that brother, he's probably not with us right now. When I look back at the age, hopefully he is, you know, you never know. But this had to be back in, let me see. This had to be back in the 80s also, the early 80s. This was on Hillside Avenue, right off of Parsons Boulevard. And this was on, I see the southwest, not on the corner. It was a few doors in. It was a bald head brother who ran that spot. And then he moved he moved over to Jamaica Avenue off of Merrick Boulevard, and it was the next block over from where Mays used to be. There was a department store years ago called Mays, and he was either next door or a couple doors down from this Jamaican music shop. It could have been West Indian overall, but I think it was a Jamaican thing, but they carried all music from the Caribbean, and they had you know the records, they had tapes, and I think they were just getting into you know the CDs and stuff like that eventually in time. But he took his book bookstore there, and he had a lot of foreign con tapes there. And just books in general, I just love to go where we can vibe and, and get into our, who we are. Sometimes saying blackness is also acknowledging whiteness. And sometimes we got to say it. No, I'm not scared to say it, but just who we are. Because we've been so scrubbed with whiteness in our subconscious minds. How we move, how we talk, it's like we have to strip ourselves. I'm not saying we do, all of us do, but many times in our unknowing state, being in this place, depending on how saturated we were in our culture and seeking out what our culture was all about, if we lived somewhere up in Maine, okay? <laughs> Which, who, well, who said it was the whitest state in America? I think Eddie Murphy said that. Hold on, let me finish off the rest of this topic. Let, let me take a sip, y'all. Give me a second. I'm telling you, I can feel this thing going through my body already. And a good sleep, I'm going to wake up feeling good. But depending on the levels it's like radiation let me tell you something white culture is like radiation to the black man or woman especially when we're not anchored in who we are when we're anchored in who we are it's like having all of the herbs all of the good food all of the rest when you get around something toxic that anyone who hasn't been taking care of themselves all of a sudden they find themselves getting ill. But since you're amped up and you had your mental, physical, and spiritual symbolic booster shot, you see what I mean? Not an actual shot, but that booster shot of your blackness, it protects you. It, it, it keeps you from becoming uh, a malnourished and, and so hungry that you'll grab onto anything. Because once you know who you are, nothing else will do. Once you know your black woman is a man, nothing else will do. Once you know your black man as, as a woman, nothing else will do. 
even when you see some of us in our downtrodden state and broken state, because being in this society, its job is to strip you of who you are with every turn. And it runs on automatic. It's not just where, oh, he's no, we ended up the way we are, whatever way we are, because of the circumstances and the environment and what we're being fed. And we don't know this most of the time. So when I heard the words of Minister Farrakhan back in those days, I didn't hear anybody else talking like that. The, the preachers were scared to speak about certain things. Pastors were scared. Politicians were scared. They'd skirt around things, but nobody would really get to the meat of the matter. It was almost like there was a law where we couldn't help ourselves and do for ourselves. But as the years went by, I still always admired him, but I was younger then, and it's almost like having that favorite uncle that always seemed to be big and strong, always seemed to be knowledgeable. You don't see him every day. You might see him once every two weeks or once a week, coming by on the weekend, grab a plate of food or the, or, or the cookout or whatever, or take you somewhere. But then you don't see him for a long time because you moved away and then you come back and realize all that time when you were looking up to him and he was big and strong, he was a severe alcoholic. And now you got big to your fullest capacity as far as your strength and you see him frail now. You're like, what the, what the hell happened? He's so small. His arms used to be so big. He always had something to say, but now it's like he's consumed in himself. He's a little more quiet. He doesn't have the energy that he had, the vibrance. Now, I'm not saying Farrakhan to me is that way, but as an adult man with my own experiences, and I still feel that he was right on point with most of the things that he was saying. There's a couple of things now that made me... um Think again, especially when there are people that I've met that have given me factual evidence on certain things from their point of view that I couldn't say, oh, this is conclusively it. But with all that I know, this is a strong possibility. It was an aha moment. So why, why I will never shit on the man, I'm kind of looking at him different. It's like that man that comes over to your home to visit with your father and, and he doesn't really hang around inside the house. He says hi to the wife you know, says hi to you and rubs you on your head and gives you five dollars. And he's always with your, your father or uncle, whatever male figure you had around you, because all of us didn't have fathers or whatever. OK, so, you know, I'm taking that into consideration, but just bend the story a little bit and understand. So now you take a ride with your father out and here's this man who's a good friend. He's always been upright, morally upright. But then, you know, your father goes into the store, leaves you there with him. And you hear him under his breath. God damn. Look at that girl's legs. Look at her ass. I'd like to hit that a couple times. <laughs> and he didn't know you heard that. But you never heard him talk like that. So as you get older, you never forgot it. And of course, you know, men express themselves in different ways. And they don't have to be creeps if he said it under his breath or something like that. You know, I've said things under my breath. I see things. I'm not dead. But it gives you a peek into a part of the person that you didn't realize existed. And that's what I'm getting at. So, and I'll tell this other story again about the man that I met when I was driving the dollar van. The dollar van looks like the Trochos out here. It runs across the bus lines. And back then it charged a dollar to go the same distance, depending on the size of your van. If your van was bigger, you had a bigger scoop or sometimes you drop off and pick up and drop off. You made good money. Well, for the time, you know, you come home with 350, 400 bucks. Then you have to pull out and gas up the next day. I'd wash the van again. But, you know, after five days and you got $400 and 400 times five is $2,000. And of course, you had things to pay with the special insurances and, and stamps. But if you did some hours on the weekend, too, and sometimes when it was a rush, you got moving jobs, you can hustle. But you, it ain't going to happen for you unless you get out in the street and you hustle, you watch your time, you watch, you know, how much you spend on gas, you know, are you making the money in that certain amount of time that you should, that targeted amount, or are you beyond it? Once you learn to read the streets, you have this ability. So that goes in any city, but every city can't have that kind of thing because maybe Chicago could have it possibly, you know, New York, the bigger cities where you, you need that alternative transportation. So you had to have your papers straight because the cops would pull you over. Sheriff would pull you over. 
taxi and limousine commission would pull you over, undercovers, the sheriff. So it was like a video game. If you were straight, you were straight. But they knew your van, they knew your van. But, you know, me going along doing this, I think it was a Saturday. It was after the Million Man March, and I had an I Love Farrakhan sticker on the side. It was like I and a heart and Farrakhan on the side. So it was like people saw that. People were with it. They knew what he was about. Even, even if they weren't a, a Muslim, per se, they knew what he was all about. So, you know, people were like, yeah, man, I like that sticker. And I would often play Farrakhan in the van, in the van while people were doing their commute in my van going to the subway station, right? So that being said, there was a brother who was standing, you know, by himself, kind of away from the crowd. When I swung the van around, I kind of got in front of him and he jumped in the front seat. And so he says, um, he says, peace, brother. And he, he had to let it out, you know, I salam alaikum. I said, well, alaikum salam, you know, out of respect. So after a while, he, he looks over at me and he says, um, I see you have a sticker on your vehicle out there. I said, yes, sir. I knew I knew he was part of the nation. He it wasn't just like he was an Orthodox Muslim. The way he was standing, this guy at that time had to be, I'd say, I'd say about 70 years old. This was in 95, 96. So if you go back 30 years, you know, back to what now? Yeah, around that time in the 60s, he had to be like 40 or in his 30s. But I know he was older than how he looked. And the way he walked was strong, but I can tell his strength wasn't to in that present day what wasn't what it was. It's like seeing the heavyweight champ of the world when he's 70, whoever it may be. You're like, listen, this is a big guy. It looks like he, he he can knock out 95% of us in the population, but you can see where he's not what he used to be. When you look at George Foreman now, and he lost a little weight, but would you glove up with George Foreman right now? And and he's older, he probably Huffing and puffing after two rounds or whatever. And you jab him, jump around, jump around, jump around. But do you really want to get hit with that one blow that has knocked out so many people when power is the thing that leaves you last? You know what I mean? So you go on a trial. <laughs> there are people out here who were never in boxing, who are well-trained in martial arts and how to defend yourself and all of this stuff. And, and you don't know. And people push up on them and they find out. You know, I had an incident earlier today, and it was unfortunate that I was going up. Mrs. Skirt was up at the property, and I wanted to get this um, particular particular meal that this one restaurant has. It was very light, lots of vegetables, lots of stuff. You know, Mrs. Skirt cooks the best to me, but I said, you know, I'll give her a break. I'll probably pick up an extra bit or whatever, but I'm going to go up there and eat. And it was soon time for her to, to be coming down, so I was going to call her and... um have a get off and meet because it was along the route of that particular van. So I took a car up. See, they have cars that act like vans, meaning how they charge. And it wasn't far for me to go. It was along that walk when we, me and Mr. Skirv were walking down the mountainside, remember? But we, it wasn't coming down. We were coming up. And it was like where we started was like maybe 10 minutes away from where we started, if we, we we backtracked a little bit. So when I first got in, I was like, you know, I said, what's the price? <laughs> and, and, oh, don't worry about it. I said, no, man, I got to know the price. Because see, these guys will act like little van, act like they'll charge you as a van and flip on you and, and, and charge you as a vehicle. So when we got up there, we got into it. So he's yelling at me, I'm yelling at him. And I'll keep parts of the story private, but it escalated, okay? He did something, I did something, I did something, he did something. Because you never know what the legalities out here. Well, anyway, he got up and ran around the car and went to pick up a stone. I'm standing there. I said, okay. We did a few things with each other. I'm good with that. But you go ahead and you take that stone and you hit me with it. Hit me with the stone. See, he was surprised that I didn't run. I actually sort of walk and taught him. I said, you go ahead and be a fool and hit me with that stone. And this guy, he was a little bigger than me. I didn't care about that. I said, go ahead. He was yelling out something. He had, he had the stone up. He grabbed big, I mean, it's like maybe six to eight inches across. It, was, it wasn't perfectly round, but he had it up. And I'm like, 
It's easy for me to make him miss with that stone. That's one shot. But if you do that to me and it hits me and I get my hands on you, it's a wrap. But who wants to go through that? Who wants to end up imprisoned when I'm enjoying myself and I have so much to live for? So he just stopped. He went back around whatever and he knew because he expected me to run. And he sort of looked at my face. And I wasn't even like I wasn't amped up like I was angry or whatever. I was very relaxed. I was very, very relaxed. The more relaxed I am, if I'm going to fight somebody, the better it is for me. And he saw that because I sort of walked toward him and say, oh, my God, this stone is not, you know, look, when you pull out a rock to hit somebody, you better you better throw it. If you pull out a gun, sometimes you're going to have to shoot it. If you pull out a knife, you're going to have to stab the person because you don't do that and you're bluffing. He bluffed. And like I said, most men bluff. I don't. I don't like those things. I'm a lover, not a fighter. I'd rather not. But if he hit me with that stone, we probably wouldn't be here doing this show right now. I would have hurt him badly. And I know that. And he knew that. And most men know when they are not equipped to do that. Now, on a moral level, I don't care if you're a wimp, if you're chubby, if you never had no training in your life. If your wife or your woman was violated, you get strong. If your children are violated, you get strong. So when it comes time to having a confrontation with somebody, right, make sure you're on the right side of morality. Because if you're not, those who may you, you think may be inferior to you, okay, they will rise up and they'll kick you behind because they got a reason to it. You hit them at the core. Like I said, no way. But like I said, no way. I, I was right. He picked up a stone. Go ahead and throw it if you feel you're going to throw it and watch what happens. Go ahead. You know, so um, it is what it is. You're going to have those kind of situations out there, but you have to know yourself. And again, like I said, I would have been in more trouble if I did something to this guy, you know, but it kind of shocked me. You gonna pick up a stone to the next man. Put your hands up. Punch me. I might let you get the first punch in just when it's, when it's time to write the police report. He punched me first. <laughs> <laughs> that was my mentality driving the bus. I'm not scared of nobody punching me. I don't want it to happen. I don't want one of my eyes to get gouged out or nothing like that. I'm no tough guy, but for the legalities, you're going to you're gonna punch me first. And once you punch me, what you have coming toward you, you're going to regret. And I have the right, especially when it's on videotape, like on all those buses and whatnot. So anyway, I took this all the way out, right? <laughs> and like I said, I'm not going to stay forever tonight. You know, I'm, I'm really kind of fatigued, but I want to stay steady with these shows, you know, whether I have met at 6 o'clock or 6.15, depending on time, because, you know, there are a lot of other things that we're doing. So anyway, um, he told me about Farrakhan. He said, listen, I was once one of Malcolm's bodyguards. I said, really? You know, and I know a lot of people can say that, but really how many really can say that? And he, he gave me the years from back in the 50s up into his, you know, his assassination or early 60s to his assassination. And he said, you probably won't believe me, but I just want to tell you that I know you're playing Minister Farrakhan now on tape. Yeah, I can see that, you know, you're a part of the younger generation that really admires him from the things that he says. He says, I'm not going to take that away from you. And I'm not going to come off like I'm a person who's against anybody, but you have to know the facts. He says, it would be wrong for me to not leave you with, with, with the information that he's government sponsored. All the talk he's been talking all these years, there's never been an assassination attempt. He's protected. This is what he told me. He said, Minister Louis Farrakhan is a government agent. He's allowed to say the things that he has to say. Because, and he, and he brought up Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson at that time. He says it's the same with Al Sharpton, the same with Jesse Jackson. They are pressure relief valves or release valves. Because when we hear words and, and poetic words spoken so eloquently against the system that, that is true, it, it stops us from being built up in our frustration to actually do something like actually really 
stop using certain people's products, boycotting them forever. Not no one month boycott. No. And making an alternative and getting up off our asses and doing what we have to do for ourselves. This is what we have to do. But having so-called leaders that were never elected by the people who were just positioned there, and we accept it because they're black, they come from our communities, a lot of them had our experiences, but they they got to them. And it's a fact that Al Sharpton wore wires for the FBI, whether it was the FBI, CAA, but they have scrubbed that information off of the internet. Let me let me let me Google Google this um again to see if anything popped up. Um, let's see, Al Sharpton was a mole, and I just put FBI behind it. Okay, and what pulls up here? It says Al Sharpton says he isn't a former FBI asset who informed on mafia figures to a special task force in New York City during the 1980s. That's that's funny. <laughs> that's like a little kid telling his grandmother who hid the cookies on the top shelf. Mommy, grandma, I did not go in the kitchen, go up on the ladder, go up on the top shelf that I'm not supposed to know about to get those cookies and only eat six of them and leave two left. And there's two left. You told on yourself. <laughs> the Daily Beast has something here. Okay. Okay, okay, wait. Now, Daily News in 2014 said he admitted to it. FBI informant, exactly. But you won't you won't really see too many of these articles out here. There's more than there was maybe before when I first got online. And maybe some things are kind of poking out. I'm gonna drop it in the um In the chat room. And that's from 2014. And in that one, it said uh, he helped the FBI secretly record mobsters with a bug briefcase. But the Reverend Al Sharpton said Tuesday he's no rat. Yes, he is. And why would you? You a reverend? And you go do that? And yeah, he might have been affili affiliated with some church, whatever have you. But how do you go from that? To doing that, so an admission of that is 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 bad enough. The FBI got you to have a recorded briefcase, but then what happened with Don King, and you wearing wires around him to see if they can break into some box and corruption? They don't talk about that now, don't they? And I've seen Don King and Al Sharpton arm in arm getting along. It's that's just such a weird world. But with the guy there from the Nation of Islam, who was once Malcolm X's bodyguard, invited me over to dinner. It wasn't some long formal dinner. He said, man, don't dress up. Just come on over, man. We're going to break bread. We're going to eat some dinner together. And I want to show you my photo album. And when he showed me his photo album, it knocked me down. Because you know you see TV shows back in those days, back in the 90s. The internet was around, but it wasn't like it is now. And you see TV shows... You see pictures of Malcolm. You see the, the generic pictures of Malcolm. The gen it, no matter who it was, whether it was Martin Luther King or whatever, you had eyes on the prize. and you had, It's the same photos. Maybe some you didn't see before, but you saw them all. So he showed me his uh, photo. He had lots of photo albums, private stuff. Malcolm coming over with his wife and kids to eat dinner with him and him being at different events and you see him in the background. Now, this guy had a striking face. I, I, there's a guy who's an actor. I can't even recall what movie he was in. This is nobody that will come to mind that quick. I haven't seen him in too many movies, but this guy, the guy that showed me the photo albums and the actor, really, really black skin. But it was, it, it was striking. It was powerful. I'm not saying black like it's a joke. I'm saying it, it was good looking skin. I'm not saying like a homo or whatever. But the guy and he, the way he ate, you can tell his skin was tight, almost like a bodybuilder right before the competition when the faces are so sunk in. But when he talked, you saw the muscles in his face. I'm not saying he had a muscular face now, but it was like, how could I, how could I put it? And this is not a put down. But he had such a striking look, you had to look at him once again. It was like one of those lizards that they have the features so 
like intense and muscular in their face. Me being an artist and receiving the visual data a little more than a normal person, it was like his, his face was beautiful in a masculine way. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say nothing else between the lines. Ain't no homo going on here, but I'm an artist and I appreciate color. I appreciate, you know, the striking visuals. But it, it was also a frightening face because his, in his visage, you knew that this man did not play. He did not play. He's a very serious guy. If this guy tells a joke, you better laugh at it. <laughs> I'm not saying he's threatening or whatever, but this guy has seen some things. And he's very serious about what he was saying. And when I saw the photo album, I saw photos that the world probably will never see on mass unless he was a take him or somebody was to take him and do a, do a story on their father or grandfather. And they upload these photos. But I mean, Malcolm looked like Malcolm. He was dressed the same way, his suit and tie. And what it, you know what I mean? But it was he was relaxed and he was around his, his, his people. And I looked at them and he he, he saw me soaking it up. He said, yeah, I bet you never saw those before. You know what I mean? That was as humorous as he was, but he was a kind man. But he told me that, and I, it never left me. And he says, listen, I don't hate the man. I didn't hate the man, but yes, he is responsible for Malcolm's death, but the government was in it, but he was a tool in it, even though he was in Newark, New Jersey at the time, but he is government protected because he's the replacement. They saw how effective Malcolm was, and they wanted to manufacture and they didn't have to manufacture anybody because Louis Farrakhan was right there with him for years. When you saw one, you saw the other. And this also makes you wonder why you never saw uh, an actor play Louis Farrakhan in Spike Lee's Malcolm X movie. Because when he ran out of money, he went to the Jews for the money and they said, listen, if you're going to have this movie and finish this movie, you need to take out the parts and have any mention of Louis Farrakhan and you can't have him in it. Because, you know, he was gaining traction with the stop the killing, you know, speeches that he was giving all over the country. And eventually the Million Man March, which was ended up being two million, you know. So I'm not against him, but the jury's out. The jury's out. And I have to be honest. So I'm not looking to find anything, but I'm aware that there could be things there. You see what I mean? So it kind of broke my heart, but it kind of, um, I appreciated that, man. I forgot what he said his name was. But again, even him, like I said, um, at that age, 30 years ago, he's got to be over 100 right now. And if anybody would live that long, it would be him. Because <laughs> he's very strong at his age and he lived a certain way. You know, and I wish somehow, some way I can reconnect with him and have him come on the show. Maybe he wouldn't know how to operate the technology on a phone or on a computer. But also, I want to say to everybody out here, we need to talk to our elders more. No matter how much, if they didn't live a perfect life back in the day. You know, we hear things about family members and different people, but they have a knowledge and perspective and a recall that if they transition, we lose that forever. Doesn't have to be somebody famous and somebody just get that information. There may be an empty lot across the street from where you live. And they remember when there was a general store there and somebody was lynched behind it. Like, okay, we don't want to really know the gory stuff, but we need to know the history anyway, because there's so much that's forgotten. Let me tell you something. I was a couple of weeks from interviewing Dick Gregory and had emailed back and forth with his wife because that's who handled everything. And we had a kind of tentative week that might be open if he didn't travel uh, to a certain destination that he wasn't so sure of. And then a few days later, I found out that he passed away. So this is why I am the way I am with the camera. I don't care who it is and what story they have. It's history to somebody. And when you have people who are there with you, older aunts, grandparents, great-grandparents, it doesn't even have to be yours. Grab your phone and say, hey, listen, can I talk to you about this area or your experiences growing up? Get them on camera, even if you don't give it to me. I'd like to have it and put it up and give credit where credit's due. I would not rip anybody off. All I'm saying is that at least get it up for somebody your own children or grandchildren, if you don't have any of your nieces and nephews, 
but it's important that we tell our own stories directly so there'll be no dispute when things become muddled and fuzzy as we share them. Ooh, I'm getting thirsty. Let me go grab, <laughs> let me go grab some water and I'll be right back. Just give me a second, y'all. Took a little sip in there. I never take long, long breaks. But yeah, when I got into that altercation, was he was trying to really rip me off on the price, and that's how the dispute happened. I forgot to add that part, and we just didn't just break out fighting. But um, I had my cameras. So I was say, "Hey, man, hold on to this while we can <laughs> bring that home to you too." <laughs> Wouldn't show it if I got my butt kicked. But no, I wasn't gonna let that happen. No, no, not with him. He already knew it. I knew it. It's just a natural thing. But yeah, um. We have so much gold and silver in our elders, really, where it's worth more than any gold or silver or depreciating U.S. dollar that we could think of. And what a beautiful way to memorialize them. We have these fancy funerals and spending all this money. And then a year after that, we forgot all that they told us. We forgot their influence on our life. It doesn't, not me. I don't care if it's a stranger. They have strangers who have talked to me at single digit ages in New York, back up in Harlem, Washington Heights, about the importance of me going forward. Not just me, just general talk. They're out there standing around. I'm out there standing around with my father, something like that. And they start talking to my father and say, you see this young man here? It's very important that he knows who he is. You see this young man here, your son? Make sure. You know, just passing on general stuff like that. We don't have that as much. You see, the elders back in the day, they knew where our blip was and their individual blips and the blips on the radar screen of life. I know I'm 60 years old. Don't scare me. I'm going to be 70, you know, create a will in 80, 90, whatever. But in each phase, there's things you must do at that phase. And there's certain things you got to let go. So for me, that's why I want to grind down and be consistent in us sharing our views and all of our family who comes on to the show and we do the conference line, whatever, whatever it may be, forums and websites and all of that stuff. You know, this is my way of kind of bringing that energy in and I can't do it by myself. So if you have anything out there, you know, as far as information or even if it's local where you live and you think that, well, well, nobody cares about where I live because it's not a big city. Oh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. So again, I urge you, if you could think of anyone in your family or in your neighborhood, might be an elder who's up in age who may have to take a little time to talk or, you know, have patience with them and just let them know that we want to preserve your story. You know, they don't know how to operate these things. There's a lot of folks that, remember, there was a woman who came onto the show. I think she was like 85. Y'all remember that? 85 years old and just shook Christianity and was so glad and how our eyes opened up and wanted to come on and talk about it. 85, I'm, I'm sure, if not 87, 85, whatever. And we talked a good long time, and I let her have her way. You know what I mean? Because when we get into those age groups, we just don't know. There's so many things and diseases and sicknesses, and our immune system may not be ready. If a person lives that long, you need to honor them, record them, if they don't want the camera in their face, if they feel it look bad, just say, listen, let me record your voice. Give me a picture of you from 40 years ago. We'll do it that way. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing, but it's a necessary thing because we don't think like to say, I need to do this now because tomorrow's never promised. We're not thinking gory. I do the same thing here when I tell little stories and different things. I want to preserve those stories. I want my kids to go back and everybody else who knows me, loves me, even if you hate me, Get the energy from that story. Because if you don't, if I don't tell it, who's going to tell it? 
If you don't tell what you've been through, who's going to tell it? And if somebody else did tell it, well, guess what? They're not going to tell it the same way you told it. Yeah? So that's what it is. But, yeah, so I'm not going to deconstruct all the good things that I've learned from Minister Louis Farrakhan. I'm not going to throw him under the bus either. But if anything is exposed that exposes him to, look, I'm still not going to denounce the good that he did. It's a funny, funny call because all my life, from when I was about three years old, that song that I played, White Man's Heaven is a Black Man's Hell, I would not go to sleep until my parents played that song for me on the record player. And it, it never stopped. There were times when we didn't have the record. You know, I found it again. It was, you know, but as an adult, there's not a day that goes by where I don't play that song. That's so people from when I was in bodybuilding, and they would be over my house, like, man, you're always playing that song. It's just subconscious. It did something to me. So maybe that's why I'm the way I am now and my parents the way they helped me to think and be aware of certain things. So I cannot remove that part from my life. If you go to a college and there's a professor there that was excellent in his craft and he took time and taught you and you had interest more so than any of the student there and on a really decent level, out of the class, you met up and you he taught you more things. Then you find out that this guy is a rapist years later. So do you forget all the things that he taught you that were pr proper, that he knew good? It's bittersweet then. You're like, you can't say, you got to say, hey, I don't condone that. He deserves everything he got. Yeah, I'm not saying give him a pass, but do you forget how he elevated you in that particular area of your life in that time? See, that's, that's the strange things that we don't really, you know, do you denounce him? Yeah, you denounce that act. But you say, even though he did that, I'm not condoning it. He deserves everything you get. But I got to give credit where credit's due. You see what I mean? So that's 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 what it's all about. But um, you know, moving along. Same thing with Jesse Jackson. He has those scandals. But who elected these people to be leaders in the black community? Now, Jesse Jackson, I got always got a bone to pick with him because after Martin Luther King Jr. was shot down. Jesse Jackson wore that bloody shirt for like about two or three days after that and did all the interviews and to be seen in that shirt. Why would you do that? Were you next to Martin Luther King Jr., you know, uh, 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 hungry for his clout? We have a lot of that. You know, we got people hungry for clout on YouTube pages and they'll backstab you. <laughs> Grown men. Crazy. But he did interviews and, and maybe he washed or not, I don't know. But he made sure to be seen with blood from Martin Luther King Jr. on him. So it was almost like he was trying to jumpstart a passing of the, cho the torch. Like to say, okay, you were there with him. His blood is on you. And you're with the same program he is or he was on. And now we need to look at you as that next person. I just, I just don't trust it. When things like that happen, Al Sharpton, no credibility at all. Totally manufactured as far as I'm concerned. Shows up when somebody gets killed or you march with them, you say some rhymes, whatever. But what have you really done? Even if the government allowed you to do a little something that looked like something, what really have you done? Black leaders, what really have you done? And I couldn't put all the black leaders' faces up here. Some of them have done good in certain aspects, but overall, all the years that you've lived in this life, what really have you done? It never ends. Somebody gets killed, you show up, you speak, you show up in your limousine, you say some rhymes, and you're done. And we're relieved because you, you talk in the way you talk boldly, Speaking truth to power, we don't realize that you're getting paid by the power that you're speaking to. You see? Yeah, see raw reality? Let me put that up. That one caught my eye. Steve Coakley said something about Jesse, which was how did he get out of Memphis right after King got shot to do an interview the next day about it? Exactly. Wearing that bloody shirt. That's too ma manufactured. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, like Cam Roberts said, they're all Democrats. Something wrong with Democrats. We know that. Something wrong with all of them. They're all in bed together. 
good cop, bad cop. But what about us in our communities doing for ourselves? I mean, even Farrakhan and Elijah Muhammad said that. Malcolm X said that. But what, why is it that we have to have leaders? Do they give instructions on how to go off the grid? Do, do, do they give instructions on classes on how to grow our own food? Well, maybe they may not do that. They may motivate people to do those things. But what have they done on a concrete level to pull us out of the system? Al Sharpton, what is he doing? Closet homosexual? Yes, he is. I don't care how many women he has posing up next to him. And you can't say, that's his business. You're supposed to be a leader. You're supposed to be transparent. And if you're really a leader and that's what you do, why don't you lead your little rainbow people? You can't even come out about that. So therefore, I can't even trust you. See, there's dudes that I know from the prison, from the jails, in the streets, like, yo, Scurve, man, you know my nigga. We always been cool, right? I just want to let you know, man, I ain't no booty bandit. I ain't going to ever hit on you like that because I know you don't get down like that, but I'm gay. But I got your back, man. And I understand how you don't like these little fruity dudes running around here. My story is a long story. That's, that's what it is. If you feel uncomfortable, I just got to let you know from me direct. You ain't going to catch me looking at your ass. You, I'm not going to hit on you. I ain't going to rub up on you. Whatever. You my brother and I love you. I love what you're doing. I'm like, good. That, and he'll say, that's what I do behind closed doors. I don't bring that shit outside. I got nieces and nephews out here. I got people looking at me out here. And some of them know how I get down behind closed doors because they do too. But I don't, I'm black first. I say, wow. I wish most of them would talk like that. And most of the homosexuals out here who are black are trying to be something else than what they are. Well, how do you see yourself first? Oh, well, I see myself as a gay black man, Paris. And so, but you say gay black man. You, 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 you mixing things that shouldn't be mixed. Either you gay or you, you what? Uh-uh. You ain't mixing that stuff. Uh-uh. You mix oil and water. You put it up on the top of the refrigerator and come back in the morning and see how separate it is. But the other brother was realistic with it. He was respectful. He told me, he says, if you ever need any help, whatever. And he said, listen, I will go across somebody's head for you, man. I say, like, whoa. <laughs> I don't condone what you're doing, brother. But damn, you know what I mean? But what are these people doing? The pressure release valves. That's what they are of the black community. Because if we didn't have these manufactured entities, whether let's say they're not manufactured, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not here to sit there and say we pretty much know who's who. You know, I know Minister Farrakhan was more effective in doing some stuff than some of these other guys, but you just never know. I still love the brother. I, I had a chance to interview him on the show back in 2014 or 15 when I first had Akbar Muhammad come on. And as you all well know, Akbar Muhammad has been to my house in Orlando to do the interview. And we did something for Fort Pierce. We did, I had dinner with him. We did something for Malcolm X's birthday in uh, Tampa um, and numerous other over the phone interviews. And when he comes out here, I just missed him. It was a couple months ago and he was here and he was, uh, how do you say it? He, he was made to be a chief. I don't want to say ordained. That sounds like Catholicism, right? But I talked to him over the phone. He said, listen, Lance, if I get to um, stay an extra day, I'd love for you to come up and sit down with me. But I might not. So he left that Monday and Tuesday he was gone. So I missed him. So to me, it's my duty that whoever, you know, even if I kind of not agree, but document and ask the questions that you need to ask of these people. Right. So I have a lot of respect for Akbar Muhammad, you know, um, but if I had to question Farrakhan to a certain degree, I'd have to do it. And these guys would respect me because, you know, that's what you do. You have to call them out. Speak to them. Let them talk to you. You can't kiss their feet and worship the ground they walk on. They're human also. If they're inspired to be something for real, the work will be done. Even if they're just motivators. You know what I mean? But what have you been motivating the people to do? It's the same thing. And, and also, too. Um, it's not the job of the nation of Islam to go out and get all the gang bangers and get all, you know, but I just find it ironic that where Minister Farrakhan is based 
in Chicago, because I know he has several residences all over the country. But it's the worst, one of the worst, with the killing and the gangs and the ratchet stuff. Come on, y'all, mobilize. Speak truth to power. Get to the, and we know the police force is dirty, but let them know this is what we're going to do. We're going to take back our neighborhoods. They used to do it, but it's a, a different breed of youth out here right now. They are just off the chain. It's, it's, it's crazy. It, it's, it's just, I don't know. <sighs> it's sickening. And then we move on over to the religious side of things, what they call religion. And I picked on T.D. T. D. Jakes. I didn't want to put like 10 faces of, you know, Christian leaders or other religion. It would have been too much. You wouldn't have seen it. So I put him up as a representative <laughs> of, of, of the preachers out there, whether it's Joel Austin, him, you know, Creflo Dollar, you know, and all these other ones who they are slick with the words. You know, they know the secret handshakes. Like T.D. Jake said, Jesus is a religion. How could you believe somebody like that? It's not even a matter of believing. It should be knowing things. See, forget this believing thing. Whatever it goes into our children's head, we need to know it, not believe something that you don't see. You need to know it. Put your hand on it. This is what it is. The pie in the sky stuff should not be in surviving into 2023. It is ridiculous. Ridiculous. And those who are obviously crooked, they're not getting called out by the ones who are supposed to be straight. It's like a brotherhood. If, if, if I have an ice cream truck and I'm driving it around in the summertime in the hood and selling ice cream to kids and the cops roll up on me to let me know that we think you're selling drugs at your ice cream truck because that was an old tactic in many major cities back in the day. You see crackheads rolling up to the ice cream truck <laughs> and they don't have no ice cream in their hand. You know what's up. But you threatening my livelihood. Now, I'm not going to go snitch on nobody. I'm going to go to the other brothers like, listen, bro, they on to you. You need to clean up your act. I ain't snitching on you on one hand, but I'm telling you, you putting me in jeopardy, man, with my uh, way of making money. And that's another thing we don't do. All them black folks sitting up in the church and they don't talk to each other. Only time they talk to each other is in the daggone parking lot when they're gossiping. A bunch of dudes out there waiting to see that new church sister that has a real nice ass. Like, yeah, she got that pink dress on. You didn't see her, man? She was sitting in the back. Well, we're going to hang out right here because I see her car right here. <laughs> you can't lie to me. I know all the tricks. But we don't talk to each other. I mean, only time we talk to, to the people in the church, unless you really have a family-oriented or a friend or neighbor type thing. But if it's a big church, forget it. All that money going up to the pastor, why don't we redirect that stuff and go into our neighborhoods and see what we can change? How about that? Pastor, we're going to give you half of what we're going to give you because we know it's going to end up in the white banks. We, and you're not helping us. And, and in two weeks, we ain't giving you nothing. So this last two weeks of offering, half offerings you get, get yourself together. We know you've been ripping us off. <laughs> Only time we speak to each other is when the pastor says, turn to your neighbor and say, it's going to be a good day after, after you give all, give me all your money. <laughs> you know, he's not going to make them say that, but you shake the hand of the person next to you. You didn't even look at them and greet them anyway. Stepping, stepping on their toes on the way out. It's crazy. And it, we're like zombies, trained puppies, trained zombies. And nothing changes. 2023, yes, there are some athletes that are getting endorsements. There's some black entertainers that are getting um, awards and all of this stuff. And we're visible. But when you go out and look the, at the reality of our neighborhoods, it's going to hell and it's worse. The killings and the hate is worse. Why are some of these damn pastors and damn leaders address that constantly? Not for a one-time thing until the next killing or shooting, because the pastors don't address that. 
unless it's their family or somebody in the congregation, but they're hush hush. They can't bring outrage to the people that they are paid to keep sedated. You can't rouse up the people in your pastor because you're getting your power from somebody else that don't look like you. That's not your job to rouse the people up, to take action, to make something better in your community. You can't do it, but stop acting like you can. If you can't make a change in our neighborhoods and our communities, we don't want to be bothered with you. That's why I say we need to do for self. Some people are good in certain areas, other people are good in other areas, but we can come together and make something happen. Those who don't want to wake up, I don't say it no more. I used to say it all the time, wake up, wake up, wake up. You want to be asleep? Stay asleep. Miss breakfast, miss lunch, miss the whole day of productivity. But what we've been toiling for all day long, you ain't going to wake up halfway without contributing and go down and get a full plate of food or whatever we have created. No. You wait on that check if you're getting one, but don't come near one of us trying to rip us off because we work hard for what we have. We're going to make sure there's a permanent scar on you or you lose an eyeball or a couple fingers to remind you of what you did. Enough with these dumb black do-nothings. Whether they're in the pulpit or they're in the street, they'll not support these people. They're doing nothing. They're not even doing anything for themselves. So how can you even think to even try to include them and give them a pass because they're black? Because we got a lot of snakes and enemies and sharks right up under our arms, down the block, around the corner, right next door, who will talk the black talk to win your good graces. They know that vibe. Like I said, demons are operating on a spiritual level too. And they give you that talk the velvet tongue and the honey lace drip words or dipped words. And you're like, oh, I didn't know this man could talk like that. All they got to do is go on YouTube and watch a few videos and pick up the vibe on how to talk that black talk. And it wins you over every time. Whatever falls off from me or around me and then that genuine goal be gone. I'm not pulling your weight. I don't know why I do what I do. Maybe it's making a, a difference. I don't know. I'm compelled to do it. But in me being compelled to do it, then if you're not with me on, on, on trying to be effective, yes, we're going to entertain. We're going to educate. We're going to vibe. We're going to share information. Just like Riri shared the information on the Jamie Foxx situation that I didn't know of. Now I got to research it. If we come together, let's enlighten each other. Because you have those out there, well, Lars, all you do is talk, talk, talk. Well, no, say I communicate, communicate, communicate. Because I ain't talking about that chick that was on a media takeout. Yes, I go to media takeout. That's the black TMZ. I look on things on there and half the stuff on there is disgusting. But every now and then there's information or a gem that's there. I also go to the message board of a site that's an adult site called Nude Africa. I don't hide about that. On one side is... You know, women and, and couples taking pictures, real people taking, but, but on the other side, there's a message board that is dead serious. They get right down to it. That's a gem. I will go where I need to go to get the information where others don't share it, where others don't have it. I don't care. If there's a, if there's a sister who's coming into her own as far as knowledge is concerned and she works up in the whorehouse while she's going through a change, I'm going up in the whorehouse with my camera. I'll make her dress decent, but we're going to talk. I'm not afraid to go anywhere. Y'all know I've sat on the curbs and talked to the crackheads. I've, I've gone here, gone there, gone in places that the world would say, man, this is a high status, whatever. It don't matter to me. If you got something to say from your positioning and I don't damn you automatically because you're a pastor. Because there are a lot of pastors out here that don't even know what they're in. They might have a little storefront and don't know and out of their heart they're trying to do something. Not knowing how wicked that hierarchy is. To keep us blind. And maybe next year he might not be blind. I'll rock with him if he shows me glimpses of, 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 of evolving. You see what I mean? But, but just to rock with somebody just because, well, he a pastor, you know, I'm not going to talk like that around him because he's going to take me out to dinner. You know what I mean? And he got a couple of chicks that he knows I want to get with them. Then I'm selling my people out because of my loins and my stomach. 
like a teacher we used to have, Miss Frazier, black woman. She she was funny. There was a guy who used to come back to class. This is in high school. He used to come back in class all late. She would always see him talking, you know, to the girls out there. And so she was always laughing, whatever, say some old slick stuff. She was like, ha, ha, ha. under her breath, but loud enough, you just a slave to your lords. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> if you weren't listening to her, you wouldn't pick up on those things. You know what I mean? <laughs> she was a clown too. She would um, like on Fridays. Would you believe she'd come to the school with a boombox? I remember she had she was playing good times. Doom, 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 ch, doom, 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 doom. And this was an older woman, but she was such a personality. Everybody loved her, and um, she wasn't like gonna land herself on the cover of any magazine for her looks but she was beautiful her personality her spirit and she was always supportive and soothing when it came time but she was a comedian but if something was wrong she would she would you know she was a real beautiful black sister and she had to be all of maybe 60 i'd say 60 but she was a genuine person and i know maybe she might not be with us on this earth right now but the energy is there. And um, she was just herself. She wasn't trying to be anything other than what she was. You know, she joke about the wigs that she have on. One time she like turned it around in the class. You saw, you saw the plaits, they were all gray. I ain't dying them, that's what it is. It, you can see on the back of my neck, I need to shave off a little bit. She was crazy. And I, I, I learned from her, just be yourself. It'll make people relax around you. When you walk around all anal returns of, I am the pastor of the, the first Baptist, so and so and so, of the down low brothers, you know what I mean? <laughs> all that for what? For what? Because when you leave this earth and your body's left there, you can't even control that. You're going around telling all the girls, yeah, you know, I got this big thing hanging over here. When you die and they see the body, They'll see that you wasn't working with nothing. All secrets will be revealed as far as that's concerned. Just to throw that in there. You got them crazy naked pictures with people you shouldn't be doing stuff with in your phone? Go ahead and die and let your family break that code and see what you've been doing all that time. Just, just a thought. <laughs> just, just a thought. You can't come back and say, oh, I got to delete those pictures out of my phone. You should have did it when you were alive. There's pictures floating around on the internet about me. Things I've done, things you'll see. I tell you, it's there. It will pop up sooner or later. Let me get a little more fame, a little notoriety. Somebody's going to find them and put them out there. I'll be like, okay, it is what it is. Let me get a copy. That's me. <laughs> it won't bother me. I don't have no shame that way. I'm built for this. I'm already preconditioned for stuff to come at me. So bring it. I'll tell you one thing, though. Ain't no homo stuff out there with me. Now, if you want to go on and do some AI and artificial intelligence, and because that's going to happen to people out here. It's going to be funny. Even though Joe Biden is a racist, no good, too old, whatever, there was some, there was an AI thing where he was just calling people niggas. And it was funny, but I knew it was AI. <laughs> now, he went off. He was going off for a long time. And it was in his... His voice is his voice, but you can tell it was the older version of his voice. You see what I mean? So that's they're going to be doing this to smear people and boost other people up. And, you know, I don't know. But listen, y'all, I'm not going to be on as long as it was last night because last night was like three hours and 30 something minutes or something like that. This hour and whatever. I'm going to hit the sack early. I will be back on tomorrow night with uh, Beatrice Noel, and I will do a separate live on whatever pops up in my head. It might be around the same length. We're going to put some work in. When I go out, the cameras are ready. They're all charged up. I'm ready for it. Got my bag ready. If somebody said fire, I can snatch it and get out with my stuff. You know what I mean? So anyway, um, yeah, 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 Jeff. Yeah, right, right in Pine, Pine Hills. Lots of them, too. If you dig deep in the archives, lots of them. Even when I was driving the bus and I had that little tiny, tiny camera. No bigger than a, a, a box of cigarettes, you know, a pack of cigarettes. Or not a box. It wasn't that big. A small pack of cigarettes. It was just like, you know, we're on a break. Say, hey, man, you know, I got this little YouTube channel online. And back then it was like, you, what, what you talking about? 
a lot of folks didn't know about YouTube and social media and taking videos. Even some of the younger folks weren't really down with it all the way. I mean, they were and they weren't. It didn't hit the saturation point that this generation has, right? Because now, especially in America before I left, if they saw me with a camera and a monopod, they'd walk up to me. I'm not even videotaping anything. Yo, so what's your channel, man? Because they knew, you know what I mean? And yes, yes, yes. The conference line tonight, again, I'm, I'm going to go on there for a little while. I am dog tired. I ain't going to lie to y'all. Sometimes I come on there and stay for hours. Sometimes I go, you know, but I'm, I'm kind of tired tonight. So I'm going to flash that number right now so you can see it for those who never been on there before. And when I get on there, here's a number. And matter of fact, while I'm still on here, let me go on there and lift the link that you can go on if you don't have a phone or you don't want to come on on your phone, you click the link and it's on your phone, but it's not going to be a phone call. It'll be just you going to a link and it will let you go in there. Let me um, log in. Wait a second. Am I having a problem? Okay, no, no, no. I'm not, I don't have a problem logging in. I'm just going to start a new meeting. I'm already there now, y'all. I'm just going to take this link. I'm going to mute myself after that so the sound doesn't go through. And let me find this link. Okay, here it is. Here it is. Bam. And I said, God damn, this is a dope jam. Yeah, I got the public enemy in me. Oh, ho, that had me juiced up back in the day. Farrakhan and public enemy. Shoot. I was walking around. Uh, people were like, yo, you play that stuff so much. We hear it down the block. <laughs> we know everything about Farrakhan. We, you're playing all this public enemy. So it was a real treat for me to meet and interview Professor Griff and have our, I can't say like a friendship, like we call each other the time he knows me, I know him. Every now and then he'll call me or I try to call him for some you know, reason. Like I think, what was the last time he really called me? It was a while ago. And he was asking me about some equipment that he knew I had like for the show. And I'll give him, I'll give him little secrets like that. They might have to put WWW in front of that link there, um, but it works and it's good. And I'll give you the other list. You know, I got to alter this um this banner. I'm trying to pull up the page for the international calling numbers. And I'm already there. But I'm I'm there, but I'm not there. I'm focused on the show. Okay, and I got to make it more prominent also. Okay, here it is. So you have several ways of getting there. Directly by that number or by the country, actual country numbers, which is not going to bring you any type of... um. It's not going to cost anything if you call from the country. Now, here it is right there, international calling numbers. So you got the link there, no charge. It's like you go into a website, you call in with those calling numbers on that page if your country is there. And I'm going to make a recording with all this instead of having to say it all the time. <laughs> with some music in the background and everything, right? That's another way of being more efficient. But as soon as the show is over or if you want to call now, mind you, if nobody else is there, which I'm already there, but I won't be able to respond. Um, it will begin to record. I usually put these up on Patreon, but this last one with Master Glam and Mix uh, genre of faves was so excellent. I may take a little teaser part of it and put it to the general public on YouTube and say, hey, if you want this, want to hear these kind of conversations, you know, going over there. And um, like I said, I appreciate those and it's always going to be uncensored. And I promise I will do something off the chain on there uh, this weekend, but shorter things. I want to pick shorter topics and go in on them and do it frequent instead of like, okay, I'm going to do this four hour show where I'm just talking and going in and research. Nobody wants to hear that. You know, they want to hear the vibration between people. And if they hear me talking about something, I'm not going to make it boring. I will make some of them funny. I will be serious on some of them, but whatever it is, will be a lot of emotion and, and, and passion in it. That's not that I'm not that way here on YouTube, but they love to take your passion and turn it against you and say that you said things that you didn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, anyway, yes, yeah, Friday night, Friday evening. For me, it's midnight right now. For you on the East Coast, it's 8 p.m. So it's a good time. Let's get some new people too. The older people that have been there, hey, it's rocking if the new people don't come. But try it out. Don't be shy. Three two one five two one two five one five. I'm gonna wrap it down right now, and just head on over there. I'll leave this up for a little while before I change it over, and um, I'm gonna be there for a little while. I hope to have a little bit of a good conversation, 
As always, it goes on for five hours before it cuts. All you have to do at the end of that is call back in again. You can knock yourself out. You can make a time to say, hey, I want to meet you there and let's talk, whatever. A lot of creative things that you can do and we're going to do it like that. But anyway, much love to you all. I'm going to play a few tunes and we're going to be here and I'll be in as soon as the show is over and cut. But you all can go there now if you wish. Much love, y'all.